Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. In this episode, we are joined by Dr. Vanessa Ingram, who is an integrative and functional medical practitioner and committed yogi, originally from the Bahamas, who now resides in New Zealand. Sounds very nice. Be prepared to learn the impact that light has on human health, how to navigate seasonal light changes and the demands of the modern world, what they don't tell you about the sun and the effect on human health, myths about the sun and how to safely, that's safely, get sun exposure, how blue light exposure disrupts our sleep, even if we think we're getting good sleep, plus much, much more. Before that though, this episode is brought to you by Riverside. Riverside is an online studio platform designed to record, edit and share high quality podcasts built for growth from day one. Powered by AI, you can record in 4K video or from your phone and automatically remove ums, as, you knows, and many other speech patterns. Built for human conversations, Riverside makes it super easy to start a podcast that sounds great. Ready to start your podcast and share your message with the world? Check out the link in the show note description to learn more about Riverside and get a 15%. That's a 15% discount off a paid subscription. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Vanessa, welcome to Raising Consciousness today. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Like I said earlier, I was hoping to show you guys a beautiful New Zealand sunrise, but we're a bit whited out right now. But I'm good. Thank you, Luke. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Really looking forward to our conversation today. Before we dive into the meat of the episode, as I like to call it, um, first question for you is who are you and what do you do? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. So my name is um, Dr. Vanessa Ingram. I'm a naturopathic physician and um, I have a fellowship in anti-aging, regenerative and functional medicine. Interesting kind of journey from, you know, becoming a physician and having a big clinical practice and then um, the COVID mandates and everything happened. So I've just downsized everything. And over the last decade, I've really come to realize that our light environment, our the, the places we spend the most time in have a huge influence of our health over our health. We sometimes like to think that nutrition is the biggest driver, but there really is this, this influence of the environment that's almost much more powerful than what we eat and light being the primary um, environmental influencer as well as EMF. And so, you know, did the whole, had the clinic in the city and kind of going to work and commuting and in an office all day. And then, the mandates happened. And then at the same time, I was, you know, I had been on this journey learning about circadian biology. And I was just sitting in my office one day and all of this you know, shit was coming up. And I was looking out the window and there was, the sun was shining and there was just every cell in my being wanted to be outside. It was a deep kind of intuitive and just overwhelming drive. And at that point, I decided, you know what, this whole stupid thing is happening with COVID and mandates. I'm just going to walk away. So uh, I kind of come full circle to kind of practicing online, being able to really follow this circadian and kind of we can talk about this idea of quantum biology lifestyle where I'm in nature, I'm outside all day. And it's just really revolutionized my own health and the way I practice um, and treat my patients. So I'm originally from the Bahamas. So I've always my whole life ended up near beaches. So I'm in beautiful Piha, New Zealand right now. And why do you do what you do? Because I love to empower people. And because I think I'm a teacher at every core of my being, at the core of my being, I think I became a doctor because I love educating people and empowering them. When I work with clients and patients, you know, I, I don't want to create this dependency. I don't want to create dependency on anyone, a nutritionist, a, um, a personal trainer, a doctor. So my, my methodology is all about teaching you why you should do different things. And then you being armed with that knowledge going forward and making those changes because you understand the biological and, and the physio physiology behind it. So I think my, my big thing is empowerment. And that's kind of makes me probably a little different from even other integrative and functional doctors. It's less about the treatments and more about teaching you to understand your own body. So you ultimately don't need me anymore. And a lot of that is teaching people that what they intuitively know, especially when it comes to things like being outside, being in nature, eating, you know, fresh seasonal local foods, it all makes a lot of intuitive sense. But I think we've overcomplicated health with our, you know, our pharmaceutical mindset and our focus on nuclear genetics, which is totally misses the mark. But when we go back to the foundation, go back to what really feels, feel, feels good. I think that's, and 
I think that's the beauty of it. And just over the past, um, you know, since that prize was won in 2017 by the um, circadian researchers, the Nobel Prize, just this, just the science to back up all these things that feel good, you know, sun exposure, going to bed early has just really exploded. So my biggest passion is basically taking the science and giving you the science of what you intuitively know about your health. That's amazing. Um, because I was just thinking about this the other day in terms of the dependency that some coaches, teachers, practitioners within health create, you know, and I'm in the process of um, training to be a health coach as well. Like one of my biggest drivers and why I've put it, put it off for so long was because I didn't want to create I guess kind of subconsciously worry about it like would I create dependency right like I feel one part of health is that being able to thrive without having to rely on a you know this expert or this expert and it sounds like through your work you as you said empower your your clients so that they can go out and, and thrive and I think that's actually what health is about so yeah that's amazing um the work that you do um yeah, I think we, we love to overcomplicate health, but at the end of the day, yes, we are individuals. Yes, there is personalization, and individualization when it comes to treatment. But at the foundation, you know, we all evolved on the same planet for billions of years. We all have the same evolutionary pressures who made us who we are today. And because of that, a lot of the foundational things around sun exposure, circadian rhythm, nature applies to everyone. So just, you know, simplifying health a bit and just even looking back and saying, what did they do a hundred years ago? I mean, to some, to some degree, not suggesting we bring back some of those old treatments, but, you know, going outside, being in nature, um, you know, a little bit of cold, you know, cold exposure, things like that. I think it can become a lot more simple. In terms of light, uh, how does light affect our health? And what do most people misunderstand about how it does affect our health? Yeah, I think we're in the era era of light right now. Just with with all the all the published studies coming through, we kind of moved through seeing human health as um, vitalistic in the old days. Then we kind of came into the biochemical, genetic, pharmaceutical age, and we're moving to realize more and more that our light environment, the light that hits our skin and comes into our eyes, is the primary driver of our biochemistry and our physiology. It's so foundational that light can, it can control things like gene expression, hormones, neurotransmitter release, um, immune system function. Almost every single part of our physiology and biochemistry is controlled by light. So it's not just that light is important. Our light environment is absolutely fundamental. And I think it's the pr our mismatched light environment and, this, and the fact that most of us have this kind of twilight all day long. We don't have enough bright light during the day. We don't have enough darkness of light at night. And this, I think, is the primary driver of pretty much across the board, all chronic disease. What would be the quote unquote ideal daily routine from a light perspective? Well, that's a good question. I think we also need to just kind of go back and start to think of light. So light isn't just one thing. And light, I like to think of light as nutrition. So just like there are many different vitamins and minerals, there's many different parts of the spectrum of light that are inc incredibly important to our body or to human health. When we, when we consider natural light, we got to realize natural light is like a recipe made up of three primary things. It's made up of visible light. Those are all our colors from blue to red. We have infrared light. That's the, the light that um, kind of can penetrate through our clothing, increases something called intracellular melatonin, which we can talk about, super important. And then, of course, we have UV light. So starting from the morning, as the sun kind of comes up over the horizon, the, this recipe, the balance of those three factors changes. So in the first thing in the morning, we have our infrared light. That's why it's, and we don't have a lot of, we have, depending on where you live, very little uh, UV light. And that infrared or that, that first morning light signal, when we have the infrared plus the visible light, that dawn, that sunrise, that's the on switch for our body. That's the, that's the signal that kind of tells tells all the body's timing to kind of get started, tells our hormone balance to get started, uh, starts to raise our cortisol so we have energy throughout the day, starts to build our melatonin, which will be released at night. So we need that morning light as soon as you wake up, you know, within 10 minutes, even as soon as you can, getting outside to see that early morning light is probably the most important. Then 
blocking that light at night so after the sun sets, being very mindful of blue light exposure. Probably the those are the two most important times. But considering this recipe of light changes throughout the day, and this recipe of light is information to your body to do different things at different times of the day, in a perfect world, one would view their morning light, maybe even stay out um, as the UVA kind of comes in, usually within 15 minutes to an hour to an hour after sunrise, depending on your location. There's actually a fantastic app to find out what time based on your GPS. You have um, sunrise, you have UVA rise, and that's called Circadia, the Cir uh, Circadian app. That's Circadia, circadian.life. It's really excellent and kind of really can help you understand how, throughout the year how the, the times change. So if you can stay up um, to that UVA rise, I call that nature's Prozac. Because UVA rise is all about increasing our neurotransmitters. That's when our serotonin comes in. We start to um, take our tryptophan and make thyroid hormone and dopamine. And that's really kind of the feel good. If anyone's suffering from mental health disorders, that morning light is, is your best friend. Then as the day goes on, that recipe changes. We have as the late morning and we move into um, noon for in most places, that's when all the that's when we have the most UV. And UV, of course, is important for vitamin D production, but UVA is important to make nitric oxide on the skin, and we can talk about the benefits of that. So, um, seeing the morning light, a little bit of um, uh, UVA, and that morning light, sorry, I also forgot to mention, is your protection, viewing that morning light and getting that light on your skin and in your eyes is really your protection against sunburn. Because what happens in the morning, when you get that sun, that early morning light, this upregulates a, a genetic program in us called the pro-opioid melanocortin system. And this is super cool. This is like your body's incredible biological compounding pharmacy. So when this, when this program gets activated, we make different peptides. And a lot of people in the kind of the health world are really interested in these synthetic peptides um, that, that basically are little um, amino acid sequences that tell the body what to do, tell cells what to do. And in the morning, we also start to make something called alpha and beta mel melanocyte stimulating hormone. So that morning light tells, starts to prime our skin to make this peptide, which allows us to make melanin, the protective brown pigment in the skin, to protect us from that uh, strong morning, uh, strong midday light. Also, if we get that nice dose of infrared in the morning before the UV comes out, what that's going to do is increase the collagen in our skin and it's going to decrease the inflammation. So it's going to help the mitochondria and the skin work better, again, so they can tolerate and benefit from the strong UV light and get that vitamin D. Then sunset, also important. If you can get outside during sunset, there is some cool research to show that viewing late, light late in the day, so as the sun's going down, can actually be protective against the effects of blue light screen use. Hopefully we're not going to be doing too much of that anyway. We'll talk about that but it can be actually protective against the detrimental effects of blue light. So if, you're, if you inevitably have to have a little bit of blue light, at least get outside late in the day. So kind of coming to the end of the day. Then of course, the, the blocking the blue light is absolutely essential, not just for sleep, um, but when we, if we have light after dark, this is, so light stimulates cortisol, especially the blue visible light. So our cortisol should be high in the morning as the, the blue light from the sun increases. And as the light goes away, it should come back down. So if we're using screens at night, we're going to have high cortisol. That's going to influence our sleep. It's going to, in men, decrease um, testosterone. And women potentially cause issues with progesterone. Um, of course, if we don't get that <clears throat> melatonin release when the light goes away, our risk of things, various cancers goes up, our risk of diabetes goes up, and our risk of cardiovascular disease increases. So just as important as light during the day is darkness at night. What would your recommendations be to people who are in different parts of the world and navigating this? So an example would be here in the UK, we're heading into autumn, winter. Um, and as, as you can see, there's kind of you know, nighttime here, but it's only we started to get dark at like, um, I think it was about half six. I'm not going to go to bed till like half nine. Um, obviously, I've got my blue light blockers on, um, etc. 
Um, and then in the morning, you know, I, lo- I wake up between half five and six and it's dark outside. So, you know, the lots now the sun doesn't come up. I think tomorrow when, when I looked before I jumped on, it said sunrise will start like quarter past seven. So um, obviously I can't get sunlight until the sun comes up. So what what are some ways how people can still get these benefits from light if, you know, they do live in other parts of the world whereby, um uh, you know, they kind of have to adapt to the environment, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So we have we have our um, circadian biology or circadian rhythms, which are our 24-hour day and night rhythms. We also have something called circannual rhythms, which are our kind of seasonal rhythms. And in, embedded in these in these rhythms, especially the seasonal rhythms, we have different programs that help us survive and we've evolved to deal in, in higher and lower latitudes. So where, it's, where we have more... Um, stronger winter signals. So just, we'll get into the light in a minute, but this is also, I think, really interesting. If you can, as you guys and and us do, um, going into winter, what you really want to do is start to bring in some cold, expose yourself to cold, because you're going to upregulate another type of system in the body, which is going to work similarly, similarly, similarly to light. So when we're exposed to cold, we actually, our mitochondria, we can shrink the space between our respiratory proteins. So the way we create energy in our mitochondria is we have these little proteins and we shuttle electrons back and forth across these proteins. And um, we create a hydrogen gradient and that hydrogen um, goes through a little motor. And as it goes through this motor, we, we can create energy. And the coal tends to shrink everything a little bit closer together. So we become more energy efficient. For people who are of kind of northern um, descent and kind of ancestrally have been exposed to cold. The cold also, through through its its effects on mitochondrial um, energy production, also in, can increase or we can, we can do something called decoupling. So we can actually um, kind of create less energy and also create heat. And those of northern descent and ancestry are really good at creating heat from their mitochondria. And when you do this, you also you also tend to create something called um, biophotons, which are ultra low level UV emissions. And so if we don't have enough light coming onto, into our, onto our surfaces from the outside, by exposing ourselves to cold, we actually make some internal UV light. And so we're, we're creating heat, we're creating a little bit of light from the inside, but we really need to embrace that cold if we are at Northern latitudes in the winter. Now, how about timing? So, this is a bit of a specific to the person and, you know, not everyone may agree to this, but I guess I think the first step is download the circadian app, just so you have a good understanding as the season go, as the seasons change, what time the, the sun kind of rises and sets and what time, if any, um, UVB is, is available. If, like in your situation, if you're having to get up early and you have to be active, so perfect world, you'd wake up. You know, you you wouldn't be exposed to any artificial light until um, until sunrise. So I wake up at I wake up around five five thirty. I do yoga, but I tend to you just use a candle or even a little red headlight. But you know that's okay for me because my yoga is pretty relaxing. I'm not trying to kind of get up and get going. If if that's your situation and you can kind of wake up naturally and see the light, that's the best practice. If say you have a meeting at seven thirty and you do have to kind of get yourself awake. You can use um, a little bit of full spectrum um, lighting. There's a device um, by a company called what's it called Soul Photovites, and they have a really nice, um, almost like a sad panel with infrared built in. And using something like that, if you do need to kind of um, uh, push your circadian rhythm a little bit earlier, just so you can have the energy to kind of perform, I think that's okay. I'm fine with that with my clients because I have a lot of you know, clients who have early meetings. So I think that's okay. Um, as long as it's a full spectrum, includes the infrared um, light. That's kind of, I think you can get away with that. But the perfect world is, you know, start your day with the natural light, end your day with the natural light. Or, and then when the sun goes away, like you're doing, wear the blue blockers, run flux or iris on your computer, um, use red lights, red lights or candles. Yeah, I was going to ask. So could we also, and maybe it's kind of, you've advanced the question in terms of the, the panel that people can get. Um, so it's, it's the panel using red light as well? Yes. Yeah, so they, I've just actually got a, 
um, one to test out. I haven't used it yet because I'm pretty, I'm very light sensitive. My eyes are so sensitive. Like it, I'm so used to not having light in the dark periods that even like even the candle in the morning is, can be pretty intense. But, um, but using a panel, I think that ha as long as it has infrared and the, the, um, the near infrared, especially because the near infrared is what protects us against, you know, too much blue light. And I think that can be appropriate. Um, you know, like I said, if you need to, you know, be more awake and, you know, start your day a little bit earlier, but you do need to realize that that, that does shift your circadian biology. So I would say use that early morning, you know, bright artificial light only when necessary. You alluded to something there that, um, about the seasons as well. So are we as humans designed to wake up and go to sleep at different times, depending on the seasons as well? Absolutely. And there is a, because in the winter and Northern climates, we have more like longer nights and more dark period. You do, there is a seasonal um, difference in the amount of melatonin we'll produce. And there is some, some thinking behind that increased level of melatonin from longer nights during the winter is actually quite adaptive and important for um, uh, healing, for cell um, regeneration, and just kind of allowing that more of a quiet healing period in some months versus a summer, which could be more active and um, kind of more of a building up um, phase. But there's also some interesting changes in metabolism that occur as well as seasonal changes in the gut microbiome. So, and that's why it's so important to eat seasonally as well, because food at the end of the day is actually a story of light because all food, all food at some point, even the processed food was built from photosynthesis. So by the, the macronutrient available throughout the year will change. Our gut microbiome will change so that in the winter, we actually shift a microbiome that's better at extracting energy from food because technically there would, would have been less food. So there's, you know, the seasonal changes, the availability of food in our environment is different. And that's really important too, to create a strong circannual rhythm, which feeds into a strong circadian rhythm. How do people apply that to their lives? Um, and I ask that because, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of people, you know, might have to get up and go to work at the same time every day, you know, if whether it's the depth of winter or, you know, the, the height of summer, right? So, you know, ringing up your boss and saying, saying, oh, you know, it's uh, winter now, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, due to my um, circadian rhythm, you know, like I'm staying in bed an extra, how, however long, <laughs> whatever it is. So is, is, this, is this for people just to be, aware, like, aware so they can, I don't know, navigate winter and just have more consciousness? Or, like, yeah, how do people apply this? How, how do you, what do you tell your clients? Curious. Yeah, so people who are kind of working at you know, nine to five jobs and they, you know, all year long as the, the light is changing, the sun still always rises. So whatever you do, I always say, you know, in the old days, people were always allowed to take smoke breaks. Now I think we should have the same ability at any job to take sun breaks. So if you get to work early and, you know, the sun hasn't quite risen or you're driving to work and the light's coming in, anytime we can open the window and get that direct light signal like into our eyes, or if, if we just pop outside, you know, from our office for 10 minutes, that's going to be protective and kind of help to um, support our circadian biology, even if we're, you know, our morning light is, um, is interrupted. But I think the best practices would still be where your blue blockers in the morning, as soon as the sun's starting to rise, you know, open your windows. If you're driving to work, pop outside for 10 minutes. And then, you know, if you are working in one of these big office buildings, you know, with all of the windows closed, because the, the, the um, glass will block UV and infrared, I'm um, only allowing the blue light to come or the, the visible light to come in, wearing your blue blockers and having, like I said, iris flux on the computer are really important. Or even bringing some of that near infrared, that red light back in. So if people are working at jobs, say, you know, on a computer with overhead lights, um, getting uh, a near infrared panel or um, Scott Zimmerman has some amazing bulbs called Nira that you can just kind of add that, add that near infrared back in if you cannot um, open your window or be exposed to natural light. I got brought up on the premise that the sun is to be avoided between the height of the day, you know, it's like a rounded day. So, you know, um, 
11 a.m. to 3 p.m., maybe even pushing to 4 p.m. because it's the strongest and it will burn you and you'll get sunburn. Sunburn is bad. Um, it will lead to skin cancer. <laughs> Have we been lied to about the sun? Because the more I dive into health, the more I kind of get this sense that there's, there's a symbiotic relationship between humans and the sun and actually it's, it can improve our health. No, that's such a great question. And, you know, I think, but first off, you know, we have to appreciate the sun is worthy of respect. It is a powerful source of energy. And so, you know, there, there are some nuances to this kind of avoid midday sun conversation. But if we start with um, this idea of the sun causing skin cancer. So if we look at the original, obviously the skin cancer everyone's most interested in, in terms of sun exposure, is our malignant melanomas. And you know, those are obviously the most the deadly form of skin cancers and the ones um, you know, people need to be mindful of. But if we actually look at the dermatology literature, what we find is not such a clear picture between um, sun exposure and melanoma. In fact, a lot of the early research that, was, that, that basically was used to, to confirm that the sun causes melanoma was actually done in labs using narrow band uh, UV lamps to irradiate usually uh, rodents or hairless um, animals, which, you know, could be, or for the most part would have been nocturnal animals. So we have an animal model and a experimental model that proved the sun caused cancer that is very suspect. When the, the light from the sun, it, even in, in terms of the UV, isn't just, isn't just a narrow uh, wavelength like these lights would be. In the sun, whenever we have UV, we also have that infrared light. And the infrared light, like we mentioned, is really the antidote to any of the, the damage that occurs from the UV. So first, so that, that was the kind of initial stuff. And then um, that's kind of where it was built on. So first of all, you know, we have that kind of faulty, faulty premise of foundation that this, this research was built on. If we look at the actual, if we look at kind of population-based studies and epidemiological studies, what we find is there is not a very clear link between um, sun exposure, even sunburns, and melanoma. There is, however, a link between increased sun, lifestyle sun exposure and, um, and basal and squamous cell carcinomas, but generally they're um, pretty benign. And if we look at all of the cancers together, we find that the more sun exposure we have, the less invasive cancers we have. So while there might be a small increase in these um, skin cancers that usually are very benign and easy to treat, we see a huge decrease in things like breast, prostate, colorectal, and many um, of the blood-based cancers. So there, so you know that there's that part of the story. So um, we had a couple big population-based studies that kind of showed this. The first was the um, the Swedish melanoma study in women, and they actually found that women who avoided the sun or the women who had the most sun exposure had a decreased risk of all the cancers we mentioned, but also all-cause mortality. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, kind of across the board. And they actually found that the women who avoided sun exposure, they actually had um, risk in terms of all-cause mortality similar to people who smoked. So the, the kind of the big takeaway from this study was avoiding the sun exposure could be as detrimental as smoking. This was repeated by... Dr. Richard Weller in a, a study on about 300,000 people in the UK, in your home country. And they kind of, they backed this up. They also showed um, the same, the same thing. So then, the, then you kind of come to this idea of avoiding the sun at certain times of the day. The sun is very powerful. It definitely can damage your skin. Sunburns are no fun. And even if sunburns aren't as um, link to melanoma as some of the initial or some of the dermatologists will tell you, because we actually find that even after a diagnosis with melanoma, the more sun exposure people get, the less their mortality and their vitamin D levels, which indicate more sun exposure at time of diagnosis is indi indicative of how well they're going to um, do with that disease. So now we come to avoiding the sun at midday. So if you are new to sun exposure, if you have very light um, skin tone, if you're, you know, redhead, then you have to really proceed with caution. And so there's a lot of talk about this idea of building our solar callus. So priming the skin, getting the skin ready for the sun, progressively throughout the year, increasing your sun exposure so that you can stay longer and longer in the midday sun. 
In terms of safety, generally, if what I tell my clients, you know, you, you need to get that morning sun that's going to turn on that palm C, make your alpha and beta MSH so you make the melanin. You need the red light in the morning for if you really can't get the morning sun and you're going to say go to the beach at midday, using a red light panel to prime the skin for 10 minutes is a great way to um, decrease the skin inflammation and increase the skin's ability to tolerate the sun. So you need to build up that sun exposure, get the morning sun. Really important as well is to not create a mismatch between the light coming in our eyes and onto our skin. And what I mean by that is no sunglasses. I'm not a fan of sunglasses. You can wear a hat if you need to, but you need that, that coherent signal coming into the eyes to, again, upregulate the skin's production of melanin to protect you from a sunburn. So once you've kind of in, in, the, in the groove of getting the morning light, maybe you're starting in, you know, in early, early spring, even in the winter, getting that light up, um, on your eye, in your eyes and on your skin, then, you know, as, it, as spring comes along, increasing your UV exposure, starting at that UVA rise early morning, very low risk of damage, a lot of benefits, and then just working up to it. So starting with maybe 10 minutes of the midday sun to get your vitamin D, and then kind of extending that. Another really good tool that I love to give clients is an app called DMinder. So DMinder is an app that looks at your GPS location and tells you when vitamin D or UVB is available in your area. And you can put in your skin type, you can put in your starting vitamin D levels, and when there's vitamin D, you press the starter, and it basically tracks the amount of vitamin D you're making and the amount of sun exposure and gives you a bit of a warning when it kind of thinks that you might have had enough sun. So that's a great tool to use as well. And generally, I'll tell people, perfect world, if you have the time, you want to kind of get between at least 1,000, up to 10,000 IU of vitamin D a day naturally on your skin. You can use that app. And then, oh, sorry, one more thing. In terms of protecting the skin, melanoma risk, and a couple other big factors, we know that the skin regenerates overnight, and we know that melatonin is important for cancer cell surveillance. So at night, when we have that melatonin and we're sleeping deeply, that's when our body can go around. And if there is any damaged cells, any mitochondria that need replacing, that process can happen. So anytime you get strong UV light, potentially even getting a slight sunburn, you need darkness at night. You need to really sink in that circadian rhythm so you get the repair program happening. And then I think the one other factor that's not um, often discussed is the role of nutri uh, nutrition. So we know that if people are eating a, say, high, high processed food diet, rich in seed oils, um, then their skin is going to be much more prone to damage. So eating, you know, consuming a lot of seafood, getting our, our cell membranes nice and strong, having that antioxidant production by eating the seasonal plants that are available when the UV light is strong. Those are the things that will protect us further against sunburn and skin damage. What about sun cream, sun lotion? <laughs> Not a fan. Not a fan. Well, um, yeah what's the yeah, yeah well, what's the um you know again brought you know brought in a uh, western culture you know it's like if you do go outside you know um smother yourself in in lotion it's going to protect yourself from the sun the more i dived into health you know i'm like quite starting to question some of these things that are in these products you know um i guess similarly to actually nutrition but yeah talk to us about sun lotion and uh good bad different what's the verdict yeah so i think we got to start with the different types of sunscreen because we have our kind of chemical sunscreens a lot of these things are absorbed into the skin and they react and scatter the uv light so that it doesn't um, reach the deeper tissues and those are things like the oxybenzone and the um a lot of the basically the, the chemical sunscreens. And these ones have been linked to certain um, endocrine disruptions. So they're hormone disruptors. And some of these compounds have been linked to cancer. The, the biggest issue with them is they are absorbed systemically. So when you use you know, the, the conventional um, chemical sunscreens, they do end up in circulation. It's been shown that um, women, you can be excreting them for a few days after one application. So not a fan at all of the um, chemical sunscreens. And then we have the barrier sunscreens, like the zinc oxide and um, the things that actually block the light from reaching the skin. And in terms of if you needed a little bit of, of protection, maybe on the lips or on the nose, I think those are that's, that's the direction to look in. 
But then we got to talk about some of the problems with sunscreen. And it is quite interesting that, you know, we actually didn't see such high rates of skin cancer until we started using a lot of makeup, sunglasses, sunscreens, and then kind of things, things spiked quite a bit. And if we kind of think about what could be going on, if we, we all, we have to think about what the sunscreens block. So when it, with most of our chemical sunscreens, we're blocking the UVA, the UVB, but we're not blocking the blue light. So we know now that there's, there's a couple studies showing that blue light exposure can also potentially lead to skin cancer. And so what we're doing, we're blocking the beneficial UVB. Um, we're potentially overexposing ourselves to UVA because we're staying outside longer because we're not getting red. And this is a problem because now we're getting too much UVA. We're getting um, blue light, we're not blocking that, but we're not getting the UVB, which is the immune regulation. And so we're kind of, we're confusing the spectrum of light coming onto our skin. And we're not able to have to upregulate all those protective mechanisms because that recipe has changed. We tend to also, like I mentioned, to stay outside a little bit too long when we wear sunscreen. And that again, overexposes us to that UVA. So not a fan at all, this is the chemical sunscreens. Like I said, the zinc oxide, same thing. We are blocking the signal on our skin, but it's, it's, at least it's kind of blocking everything. The uh, barrier sunscreens will block some of that blue light. Hmm. So I think actually it'd be pretty important, maybe if you're working inside all day on a computer to maybe wear sunscreen, but out in the sun, I like to tell people wear a hat, cover up. When you are hot, when you've gotten too much sun, we have this beautiful mechanism, we get pink. And when you get pink, that's a signal, go into the shade. So mm. I think um, that's kind of my take on sunscreen. So you're better off just looking at your body signal. As soon as you get pink, cover up, sit in the shade um, versus kind of confuse that signal, trick yourself into staying out too long, getting too much of that UVA unbalance, which could potentially be driving the, the cancer epidemic. It's interesting. It's like our, our body gives us signs all the time, you know, and I think in a way we've kind of, lost the ability to pay attention to like the signs that our, our body is is giving us and they just kind of um, brought another one in, into my consciousness so thank you for that and i'm sure our listeners as well continuing on the theme of the sun um sun gazing um i have been listening to or i listened to a podcast most recently last week with um I think it was an eye, an eye doctor who wasn't a fan of sun gazing, um, but then mm. some other within like the you know and you know kind of scientists and, and I I even think Dr. Herman um, is a big fan of getting sun in the morning and um, I, I don't want to quote him or anything, but I'm pretty sure I could have heard somewhere that actually sun gazing in the, those lower parts of the day, you know, it's when the sun isn't at its highest and maybe could damage the RIs, um, helps with the everything we've been talking about in terms of the light. So are you a fan of sun gazing? And if so, how we do that safely and the effects that has on our health? Yeah, this is really interesting. And this is not probably completely scientific but it's a really interesting because i've been a yogi for a long time and i've been really i had an experience when i was living in toronto where i went to see this guy h hmr he was a, and he's the famous sun gazer breatharian so he was the guy that was studied and they locked him in a lab and showed that he didn't eat or drink for i think 30 days so you know I, that seed was planted back then i was like okay sun gazing you know i started to do it he taught us how to do it but then learning more about how UV light interacts with our body, I learned kind of years later about how when um, UV light hits, so back to this brown pigment melanin we make when we're exposed to UV light. So this melanin in the skin is almost like it is basically a, a biological um, solar panel. So it's able to actually create energy on exposure to UV light. And when the light hits this melanin, what it actually does, it has the ability to charge, separate water. So it, it splits the water that's next to the melanin in our, in our cells into um, hydrogen, oxygen, and some free electrons. And these free electrons basically represent energy because we're using, because energy production is based on electrons. It's not really based on macronutrients. It's the electrons in the fats, the carbohydrates, and proteins that we use to create energy. So 
kind of back that up, we realize now that we can actually make energy from sun on our skin. And so what I think is going on with sun gazers is I think, and this is a bit of a funny idea, but I think there's something about watching, because you know how the sun gazing works. You start with, you know, 30 seconds and then one minute and you increase it and increase it. And I think what's happening is we're getting like some kind of cosmic or genetic upload if we do this for long enough that basically helps our body increase that process of energy production from from sun maybe. And that's what allows actually doing that sun gazing protocol um, allows these guys to actually move to eating less and less food because they're connected to the earth. They're, you know, doing their their sun gazing. And maybe that's how that's how they're able to become breatharians. But that's just my thought. But in terms of um, in terms of is it safe? We know that infrared light, um, what even you know, three minutes a day looking at infrared light improves visual acuity and can actually repair the retina, especially if you've had a lot of blue light exposure. So I think it I think it would be safe um, as long as you're doing it early in the morning. You know, that half an hour before or after sunrise or sunset. I'm not giving this as a recommendation. Obviously, you know, do your research, but I think it's safe and I do it myself. So interesting. So but as long as it's in that early morning. Yeah, the the, the early morning part. And yeah, there's just something also I think maybe more spiritual for our spiritual well being, our spiritual health, you know, watching the sunrise and the sunset, um and, and connecting mm. kind of with that. The sunrise and sunset it's like the greatest show on earth. Like how can you not have some I don't know reverence to life when you see that you know the colors and the sunrise it's like you know the beautiful start and end to the day so you definitely what else about the sun do you think people need to know when it comes to their health that we haven't spoken about yeah i think so obviously we talked a lot about kind of uv and that sun exposure directly in our skin but i think one of the most underappreciated um, benefits of the sun and being outside is the near infrared light and that and the influence of near infrared light on intracellular melatonin. So we all know, or most of us know about pineal melatonin. That's the melatonin that's made in the day when it's bright, released at night. But we've, thanks to Dr. Scott Zimmerman's work, we found out that that probably only represents about 30% of our total melatonin in our body. 70% of that melatonin is actually made in the mitochondria in the cell on exposure to infrared light. And it's so, so important because this intracellular melatonin is probably the body's most powerful antioxidant. So magnitude is more powerful than things like glutathione, which many people have heard about. So our mitochondria are little, like little engines and they produce oxidative stress. And, you know, that can, if that um, if that isn't in balance, that can damage the cell. And that melatonin is almost like the coolant of the engine. It allows the engine to work really fast and really well while keeping the oxidative stress down and kind of cooling things down. That intracellular melatonin is also the most important factor when it comes to mitophagy, so the recycling of old mitochondria. And this is probably one of the foundational aspects of aging and so all chronic disease is, is to some degree based on mitochondrial dysfunction. So just being outside, you don't even need to be in the sun. You don't even need to have your skin exposed. You're going to get infrared light. Infrared is very long wavelengths. It can penetrate up to eight centimeters in the body. It goes right through bone, right through the skull, into every, every cell of our body. And it really is so easy. All we need to do is open the window, go outside. Um, if you can be around. Um, plants or trees, you'll get even more, sitting in the shade, working outside. Um, and I think that's, you know, a joke, you know, when I give health advice, you know, the, the foundation of health is go the fuck outside, really. And it's so true because just getting that dose of intracellular melatonin, which we, we would have got all day long, um, evolutionarily, we've been outside all day long, you don't need to be in the sun. And I think that's probably really, really important. And at any time, 50%, about 50% of the sunlight will be that infrared. And I think that's probably the most underappreciated aspect of, of sunlight. In terms of blue light, um, lots of blue light blocking products on the market now. Um, what do people look mm -hmm. for, in your opinion, when they are investing in blue light blocking 
products. We'll get back talking to Vanessa in just one moment, but before we do so, I would just like to mention OcuShield. OcuShield is one of the leading brands in blue light blocking technology. They're medically approved FDA and MHRA screen protectors and blue light blocking filter glasses filter out harmful blue light, protect our eyes, skin, and help us do sleep better. I personally love their anti-blue light filter for Mac and iPhone and make them my first stop when it comes to blue light blocking products. You can try out OcuShield for yourself by going to the link in the show note description and making Zoom fatigue, eye strain, dry eyes, and sleep disruption a thing of the past. Now, Let's get back to today's episode. So I think one thing we just got to be mindful of is, yes, the eyes are going to be the most strongly influenced by blue light, but we have this blue light receptor called melanopsin, not just in our eyes. We have it in our skin, in our blood vessels, in our subcutaneous fat. So while, we, while protecting our eyes is the most important, we have to also be mindful and careful that we're not exposing our skin to more blue light when we wear our blue blocking glasses. Like, you know, sometimes I had found with clients when they got their glasses, they're much more likely to have the overhead lights on in the bathroom or, you know, watch Netflix or something like that. So yes, you can use the blue light products, but I'd say just be more mindful of your light environment in the evenings. Um, and in terms of glasses, there's so many things on the market. Um, there's, I don't know where you guys are in the UK. Probably Block Blue Light. Um, UK is a good, a reputable um, distributor. There's quite a. There's um, if you, I don't have the link for it, but there is a. It's not perfect, but there is also a little um, blue light, almost like a paint swath card, and it has three. If you just Google um, blue light glasses test, you'll find this um, this picture on this this a really nice blog, and it has the red the blue and the yellow, and any glasses that have that red tint, if you look at that and you can't see the blue, they're probably okay. I mean, I'll be honest, because I've broken so many of my $100 blue light blocking glasses throughout the years, um, you can get, I, I sometimes go on Amazon, you can get their DeWalt, DeWalt laser safety glasses, and they're these super red, I can grab them, super red glasses, they're about 12 bucks, and they're great just to kind of give you some proof of concept of, of how important blocking blue light is, and then maybe investing in the more expensive ones. So I'd say blue light uh, glass is really important. Hopefully you're not using uh, your computer at night, but definitely all day long you should be running Iris or Flux. Maybe you can we can link to those. And those are programs that will basically change the color temperature of your screens throughout the day. There's also a, for your phones, again, hopefully we're not using our phones at night, but there is a, it's, if you just Google red light hack on iPhone or Samsung, whenever you'll find um, this process by which you go in accessibility and set a color filter, and you can make your phone completely red. And that's much better than using, say, Night Shift and the built-in programs. Very excited in terms of computing. There's a new uh, product on the market called the Daylight Computer. And I've been, I ordered that last year and I'm still waiting on mine. But this is basically like a completely blue light free um, tablet. It's like a Kindle, but the refresh rate is, is much faster. They have some incredible screen technology in there. You can watch videos. And I think that's going to be, be a game changer for people who do need to use um, tech at night. But sorry, back to blocking light at night. The glasses, um, definitely wearing long sleeves, you know, covering, covering up. If you're going to use, use the computer or say have to go into a bright lit area. Um, and then just being... Yeah, just being mindful overall, especially in the sleep period. Like your bedroom needs to be, no matter what, I say, like completely dark. If you holding your hand up in front of your eyes, if you can see your hand clearly, that's way too bright. And um, that's going to be suppressing melatonin. So then wearing an eye mask, block up, uh, block out curtain or uh, light blocking, you know, the curtains, super important. You know, covering little um, LED lights on devices with black duct tape, really important. Because we start to see mel melatonin suppression at three lux, definitely at 10 lux, which is an incredibly small amount of light. And especially in that sleep period, it needs to be completely dark. Do you think that people might have a hard time being open to the, I guess, the idea 
of the effect that blue light has on them when they go to sleep. Because let's say they do are on their phone or they are watching Netflix, they then go go to sleep and they quote unquote sleep fine and they wake up fine and then they go go to work and go about their daily routine. But maybe they're not aware of like the under like the effects underneath that kind of like brewing as I like to think of it, right? What's your thoughts on that? Do you, do you think that that's a mis? I don't know if you call it a mistake, but do you think that's sometimes where people enter in their thinking, like if they don't see the effects of go watching Netflix like sh- like straight straight away, you know, then they think it's like nothing's happening, right? Like it's fine. Yeah, definitely. I think it's tricky. It's tricky because we're not very good at judging our sleep sometimes and sometimes people can be tired enough that they kind of they they fall asleep well but often what happens especially if we have that blue light exposure before bed we don't go into the deeper phases of sleep especially the um the short uh the delta kind of sleep where we get our growth hormone release so light at night even if you feel you're sleeping well over time will be detrimental because you're not getting the growth hormone the melatonin release which is going to be reparative to the body. So in those people that, you know, think they're sleeping well, sometimes we see little sneaky symptoms. Big ones are joint pain, getting sick, brain fog, hormone imbalances is a big one. So low testosterone in men, that doesn't make sense, especially in younger guys. Um, All of these can be kind of chronic signs of even if you think you're sleeping really well, you're not getting into the deeper phases of sleep and not kind of preserving that sleep architecture because you're not getting the proper melatonin release. So, yeah. But there's always those people that are like, no, oh, I had a cup of coffee at four o'clock and two minutes <laughs> before bed. And I was watching TV and I just fell asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think people just need to try it and they need to, they need to be consistent too. You know, these effects you know, doing it for one night, if you've, you know, had circadian disruption for 20 years, you're not going to see a benefit. But doing it for 30 days, being consistent, you need the morning signal and the night signal, the light and dark, then people just start to feel better. Even if they thought they were feeling okay, then they start to feel actually really good. And then they see the difference. No, I've definitely seen a difference um, keeping my bedroom darker than what I used to wear on my blue light. Blockers. So I actually broke a pair of my glasses um, over the summer, and um, it, it, it took a you know a, I think like a week or something for a, a, another pair to come. And like in that week, you know, um, I, I know it's, it's the big difference because like beforehand, approaching kind of bedtime, you know, I would just naturally feel like more calm, more peaceful, like and just kind of just gradually feel myself get more sleepy i guess you know like re- ready to fall into sleep and then as soon as i did, did have my blue light blockers and i was exposed to 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 more light i was like just more 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 awake you know <laughs> like and it's just like oh you know um and so i i felt the effects of that for like the first time actually and so that um i guess proved to me that you know it does work you know um having in some sectors you know some some sectors and some people might be a bit skeptical um of blue light blocking products and, and stuff so um yeah i definitely experienced that over the, the summer and uh yes, yeah. yeah but i always like to challenge my clients who say they're night owls and i'm like i mean you know on some level of course you're a night owl if you're exposed to light at night you're using your computer light you're spiking your cortisol you're, you're changing your circadian rhythm so for those people if they're open to it my big challenge is go camping you know, go somewhere where you're just, you know, you have very little artificial light. Do that for three days and then report back. Are you still a night owl? And most of those people will say, oh, man, after the sunset, I was exhausted. I was outside all day. I went to bed at eight o'clock. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 obvious, but sometimes people need that that experience. So, yeah. Vanessa, um, what's one thing we didn't speak about today that you feel is important for us to cover in the time that we have left when it comes to pretty much everything that we've been talking about, light, sun, blue light, and the relationship with that with, with our health. What's, you know, what's one thing that you want to leave our audience with? Well, I think one thing I forgot to mention, because you were talking about northern latitudes and you know the difference between the amount of UV light in the summer versus the winter. Something that I recently learned, which I thought was really interesting, is that everywhere on Earth gets a similar annual solar yield, which is kind of crazy to think. So up, you know, in your, your part of the world, you may have super long days in the summer, a lot of sun, and then really short days. 
back to that idea of circate or circannual, that seasonal um, rhythm. Actually, if you're healthy and it's appropriate, I actually think, you know, staying up later and exposing yourself to more light in the summer, getting as much light as you can to build up, to take you through the winter and then just going to bed earlier, you know, honoring those longer nights is, is quite important. So kind of working with that and realizing that you're going to get as much UV hitting the earth where you are as someone in the tropics, but you're just going to, it's just going to be out of balance, just going to be, you know, different distribution throughout the year. But kind of, if you're able to, like I said, wake up extra early, you know, wake up at five o'clock in the, in the summer, get all that sun. So then in the winter, if you do need to, you know, you don't have that morning light signal and you're going to bed earlier, that's, you know, over the year, it all kind of balances itself out. It's amazing. Yeah. It's not, it's not something I've, considered beforehand but i think um this winter and then like into next year like into next spring something that um i might give a, a try so mm -hmm. thank you for for sharing that with us um where do people go if they want to keep in touch with yourself and learn more about your work and everything that you um have got, have got going on yeah it's an interesting one because i'm at a bit of a crossroads in my life because the more i learn about circadian rhythm and being outside the less i want to be on social media <laughs> But I do have, um, you can find me, I'm on Facebook, Dr. Vanessa Ingram, um, I-N-G-R-A-H-A-M. You can find me on, I'm not, haven't really gone into the Instagram thing, it's just so dopaminergic and <laughs> so hard to deal with. But I'm also on LinkedIn, um, post a lot there. Uh, you can check me out on my website, um, drvanessa.life. Um, I, I do some group coaching, um, some different packages, and I work one-to-one -one with with uh, clients who are accountable and want to learn and make changes. And then I'm also uh, on my, I have a YouTube channel under the Naked Doctor and a TikTok as well that I sometimes make videos on. Excellent. I will, I will link that all down below. Uh, Vanessa, thank you for your time today. It's uh, been a pleasure. I learned so much. I'm sure our audience has as well. And um, hopefully we can continue to have these very important conversations because I think it's important. Uh, not just to raise consciousness around these issues or you know, these topics and potential issues as well that we face, um, but also to help people improve their health. So thank you for your time today. Thanks so much. I'm going to go for my walk now. And I wish I had my Lux meter to show you guys because you can see it's completely cloudy. Yeah. But the light out there will be orders of magnitude brighter than the brightest indoor light. So I just want to remind people, this is really important, even if it looks like this outside, if it's raining, that light is still much stronger than any indoor light. You still need to go the fuck outside in the morning. I love you. Thank you. Enjoy your work. Thank you. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode with Vanessa Ingram, where we've been learning about and exploring the effect that light has on human health. The main lesson that I've taken away from my conversation with Vanessa today is how seasonal light and the whole topic of syncing up more with nature in this way matters. While it's harder to do in the modern world, I'm a huge believer that we create our lives by design and therefore we can shape our lives to sync up more with nature if we really, really want to. And the more I learn about it, the more that I'm definitely inspired to do so. What are you taking away from this episode? What did you learn? And what positive uh, changes are you going to make as a result leave a comment or review below this episode whether you're watching on youtube listening on spotify or apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from i read every comment and review and appreciate you being here and listening to the show i look forward to sharing the next episode with you really really soon see you then